how we are incentivizing our partners and, and it has changed the partner programs um, to drive the right behaviors that we're expecting from partners. Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into Channel Voices, the podcast for future channel leaders, where we learn the ins and outs of partner ecosystems through casual conversations with channel professionals from a variety of industries, partner types, and geographies. My name is Maciek, and I'm your host. The Channel Pro in this episode work for companies like Verizon, Avaya, and Juniper Networks. Today, he holds Senior Vice President of Worldwide Channel position at Nutanix. As a member of the executive leadership team, he has the responsibility of strategic direction of Nutanix Channel Partner Ecosystem, fostering strategic relationships and developing global sales and distribution programs for VARs, distributors, OEMs, global system integrators, and telco partners. Christian Alvarez, welcome to Channel Voices. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you for being here. I've been doing this podcast for nearly a year at this stage and uh, concentrated at the beginning a little bit more on how to set up channel programs, how to how to work with partners, how to establish these relationships, um, how to also go and recruit partners. But having you on the podcast today, I wanted to look into that, you know, how do we maximize driving sales uh, through channel? So if we were to look at um, a scenario where a vendor already has channel established, but are looking to accelerate growth either with net new logos or increase wallet share from existing channel customers, what would be the most common and effective strategies? Well, if I had any uh, thoughts, uh, I think you're a part of our company because that's a very common question I get from from our senior leadership and our and our sales leaders. Look, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in, in your audience. Look, first and foremost, what I have found to be a winning formula is 360 degree alignment, alignment with your go to market team, marketing and your channel programs team. Uh, it's it's so critical to clearly define the objectives, set those goals, be it growth around new logo or incremental ACV from new logos. Um, in other words, what is the desired target? And make sure that you clearly define what good looks like and by when. And by when is so important, right? Because sometimes people say, well, we want to add new logos and we want to grow, but be very clear on those objectives and quickly take inventory and stock of the existing programs you have. There's nothing worse than these reactive um, initiatives of we need to drive growth and we need to bring in new logos and let's go spin up a new partner program. And sometimes not only does that put a lot of pressure in your partner programs teams, but also confuses some of the partners, right? Because they're like, well, I see you launched a new program. Is that on top of this other program that you rolled out earlier this year, right? Keep it simple. Um, Inclusion. Inclusion is so key, right? Nobody really likes these programs and and these initiatives to be in a vacuum. Um, Promote it. Awareness right? Create awareness around all of your sales and marketing teams, and obviously your channel partners. And lastly, measure what matters. Make sure to track progress often and include it in your standard cadence. Um, and, and, you know, everyone knows what you measure, you can really put a lot of urgency around it. And that simplicity, that keeps coming across Anyone I talk to within the channel, when they talk about channel programs, how they design them and what they want to get out of, the, out of it as an, um, as an end result, it all comes down to simplicity. We've see, we see that you know, time and time again where additional programs are being introduced or there's another layer to a program and partners do get confused, right? <laughs> and then you have to fight with fight with fire or fight with putting out the fires rather than concentrate on those things that matters. But what I liked 
what you said is it's not only what it is that we want to achieve, but by when, right? And putting that plan in place and agreeing with certain partners or whoever whoever is targeted with with these new incentives or these new programs or the revamped programs, like give them some kind of a toolkit, right? Awareness, obviously, awareness is huge, but also enablement, right? How do how do you wish, or how would you prescribe in some situations, maybe even, for a partner to go out there and either get new logos or drive that incremental revenue? That's right. So, are there any differences in the strategies um, between the kind of you know the typical software vendor versus the the SaaS or recurring revenue based vendor? Look, a lot of the SaaS uh, bookings come from service providers, right? We've seen a lot of maturity and focus in that area. Uh, SPs usually build their services on top of, you know, vendors' technologies, which, which is a great thing. Most SaaS companies have some or all of their businesses going direct to customers, right? So that also creates a little bit of friction when you have a partner ecosystem and you have a, a direct model. I'll say it, I'll answer it this way. In, in today's consumption and subscription-based economy, how customers are selecting, procuring, and consuming technology has evolved. And I believe that, that it's gonna continue to evolve. Customers are increasingly preferring to pay for access rather than retain title and have ownership, right? It's the, it's the subscription world we live in. Um, as a matter of fact, the vendors that are providing access to a product in exchange for reoccurring fees are the ones that are truly thriving. Um, and, and, and this has certainly changed how we are incentivizing our partners and, and it has changed the partner programs um, to drive the right behaviors that we're expecting from partners. So you mentioned incentivization there. Um, what are from maybe your experience or what you see in the market today, or maybe feedback from your partners, what are the types of incentives that motivate partners most? It's a good question. It depends on who you're talking to at the partner, right? If you talk to the owners, they obviously look at it in aggregate, uh, a lot of back end, right? That helps um, their, their top line. Um, and then when you talk to an account manager in SC, right? They like a lot of that front end. It helps them with that one particular deal, getting to the pricing point that they need. Uh, and usually, you know, the spiffs that enhance their uh, profitability as well. Um, but partners are, are typically liking to see uh, a lot of a lot more on front end it's helping them develop demand gen campaigns it's helping them in in a lot of you know pressured opportunities that have a lot of headwinds and you know they're trying to leverage getting the pricing point where they need where they need actually in order to be com complemented by their services because that's really where a lot of the margin is coming from today is on the professional services that the partners are providing. Right. What I've been seeing quite a lot, obviously different audiences within, within a partner. Yes. Reps and account managers very much coin operated and whatever they can get up front to close that deal quicker. Um, on the partner side, what I see quite a lot these days is that partners are looking for something that isn't necessarily on the price point, but other areas where they need help and be it um, marketing development funds um, or anything of that nature, that additional enablement, training sessions, um, playbooks, whatever it may be. And they use that to drive more business, either train their people or do those demand generation campaigns 
organizing events as well of, of their own, right? And getting leads and opportunities that way. Um, it's very, it's very interesting to see how that has developed. It's not all about this is this is what I'm going to get out of it. But if partners looking at it, how can you help me not only grow your business but grow my business? That's right. And obviously, partners have choices, and partners work with multiple vendors on daily basis. What can a vendor do, I suppose, to stay top of mind with their existing partners? Look, both the vendor and the partner should see each other as an extension of their respective businesses, right? Each company should know their capabilities, right? Oftentimes, um, manufacturers don't invest the time to learn the capabilities of their partners and their resellers. And a lot of times when you build that bridge, and you can really leverage your channel account managers to educate go-to-market within the manufacturer on the capabilities. And I mean capabilities like skill sets, capabilities like global logistics, capabilities like specializations in you know deploying a workload in a public cloud or a private cloud, or moving a database from on-prem to off-prem. And when, when you invest the time to have intimacy and learn the power and the capabilities of your partners, which by the way, even distribution has tons of value and capabilities that it has to be reminded and, and create awareness within each of those companies, right? And that's truly leveraging the power uh, of a partnership. And that fosters also collaboration, right? Because then your sales team wants to leverage this partner that has this incredible skill set and, and capability. Um, I would also have to complement that with enablement. Enablement, enablement is so important, right? Especially when there's new product introductions, um, leveraging the OEMs or the manufacturers technology alliances. And this is a great example where one plus one equals three, a lot of manufacturers have strategic alliance relationships. And I don't mean the ones that are just a press release and they move on. I mean, the ones that really have meat on the bones. They, they do interoperability testing. Support is integrated. There's R&D between both companies. There's certifications of both products that are certified to work together. And these are very powerful tools and enhancements that partners can really leverage so that we can stay top of mind to them. And quite frankly, they can stay top of mind with us. Interesting that you you specifically mentioned distribution. Is there a feeling within, within the channel community that distributors do not add that value that they maybe used to back in the day where there were less types of partners? There are. And I think it's a lack of... Um, it's, it's, it's not a lack of, of education, but it's more of, look, the lines have become really blurry. Who's a traditional VAR? Who's a system integrator? Who's a service provider? And as I mentioned before, how customers are selecting, procuring, and consuming technology has evolved, and it has put a lot of pressure on distribution. But look, many of the distributors around the world saw this coming a very long time ago. And if you look at today, what's happening, you can see that many large distributors have built marketplaces. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars to build marketplaces. Look at the acquisitions that we often read every day of companies that distributors are buying. And that if you take a step back and look at the profile of the companies they're buying, that's a great looking glass as to where distribution is going. It's no longer pick, pack and ship, right? It's no <laughs> longer these big warehouses with forklifts, not at all, right? Um, but, but I'll say it again, there's a lot of value that distribution can bring to companies depending on your business model and how you go to market. Excellent. And in terms of the other type of partnerships, how would you how would you use something like a technology alliance to drive additional sales or new logos 
by being able to go to your existing partners that have an existing customer base that they've successfully sold something to and assuming that that partner is doing all the right things for that customer, right? And they have intimacy and they're keeping the finger on the pulse of that customer. They're listening and learning what new pain points and challenges is the customer having or what new business models or direction is that customer going by being able to go into uh, an alliance partner that the manufacturer has. Now it basically gives that partner the ability to go back to an existing customer and upsell them new solutions and new technology that's complemented by those alliances agreements that the manufacturer has. And this is really a phenomenal way of done properly to really upsell and expand that wallet share that that partner has with the customer. Exactly. And obviously the marketplace is coming into play as well. Um, all of those good things that, like you said, distributors are doing as well. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to see. If I was to ask you for your top three tips for driving channel sales, what would you, what would you give us? Three letters. T-A-G, tag. And this is something that's near and dear to me. I often talk about it. And it's um, it stands for trust, alignment, and growth. And in any partnership, professional and our personal lives, any partnership is built on the foundation of trust. If you've established trust, then you should be able to get aligned. What is your partner's goals? What are their growth goals? What are their growth objectives? What are their go-to-market objectives? And share those with the manufacturer, the other partner. What are our goals and objectives? And are we aligned on those? And it doesn't have to be 100%, right? It could be 70, 80% aligned. That's actually really good. So if you've established a foundation of our partnership on trust, and you now achieve the alignment, then there's no reason why we can't grow our respective partnership and business together. So no longer just here are the targets, here are the KPIs that I'm going to measure you on. Please go and do it, right? That's right. Excellent. And uh, Nutanix have um, revamped the partner program last year. What are the things that you have seen since changed and maybe some of the successes that you have seen from from doing so yeah we're really proud of the partner program that we built and we being the key word um, our partner program elevate was born september of last year so just a little over a year old and it was a partner program built by our people we actually crowdsourced it internally and it was unbelievable the the involvement of the team because they felt they were part of creating something. And we were very focused on very fundamental things. Profitability for our partners, that's important. Simplicity, I'm obsessed with simplicity. I truly believe that complexity hinders growth and innovation. And we set out a mission that our new partner program should be no more than one or two slides and should be able to be explained in seven minutes or less. We focused on getting away from having lots of different partner programs for the various different routes to market to one global, simplified, standard partner program. And we achieved that, and we're really proud of it. Um, What I saw as the biggest highlights and the benefits was the pivot Uh, to a 100% competency-based partner program. That means we put most, if not all of the value on the partner's competency and skill sets and specializations, not so much the big partner that sells the most. Um, we, We also saw, as a result of that, we saw huge investment from partners in certifications. Uh, We also saw better predictability. We made significant investments in our partner management system, our partner marketing systems, how partner 
interact with us, how they consume our intellectual property and collateral and marketing tools. Um, so there was also a huge, huge increase in partner recruitment, partners that were genuinely interested in becoming a Nutanix reseller. And we were also really proud that at the time that we rolled out our new partner program, we wanted to have our own report card to see how we were doing. And we rolled out our net promoter score um, with partners all around the world. And I'm really happy to say that to date, we're staying above 80% um, in, in our net promoter score, which isn't easy. It is absolutely not easy. You know, partnerships are usually love-hate, depending on what's going on in that time of the quarter. Um, but in, in all seriousness, um, we're really pleased and very happy with the feedback that we've gotten from our partners. It's very interesting to hear that focus on specialization and it it's driving those um, certifications and partner really investing time and money to uh, to do that. It's been mentioned on a couple of podcasts um, previously, but it's it really that route to specialization seems to be a massive focus for a lot of vendors today. It resonates very well. It really does. And look, there's no better time than to partner with Nutanix than now. Fantastic. There is a question that I that I always ask on the podcast. There'll be no exception to you. I know that a lot of the audience would like to hear what was what is the one thing that you wish you knew before you started your career in channel? Wow. Well, uh, it's uh, it's certainly an interesting question. I have to say that I was very lucky to have been a reseller myself for a little over 11 years. And, and I can certainly call that, you know, having an advantage uh, because at the time I believed I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. Uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the one thing is I wish I really understood how deep the roots of companies that have or started as a direct company uh, versus indirect. Um, that's something that I have to say throughout my career, and I've, I've worked for a few manufacturers that started direct and then introduced the hybrid indirect. Um, that That's something that um, I wish I knew more of and understood better than, than going into the channel. But I've adapted. I've certainly evolved. Uh, I think coexisting in direct and indirect especially as the market has evolved. Um, it's a win-win. At the end of the day, something to have very clear in my mind, we're here to support customers and giving customers the absolute best experience in the technology that they're investing in, assuring that you know they're getting the value out of their investments. And, um, and that's why I believe that the evolution of how we partner is going to continue to evolve. And, and things like having partners with a customer success practice is critical. Giving partners more tools and insights into how their customers are adopting the technology, utilizing the technology, and giving that partner that telemetry is going to give them that much more of an advantage, but a great experience uh, to the customer. Great to hear. Thank you very much for sharing. You mentioned customer success experience. I've and there, there's an episode of, uh, on that for for people who want to go back and um, listen to it. There's a there seems to be a rise of partner success organizations on within vendors, and. Typically, it would we all used to customer success. This is this is it's it's common within every company, regardless if you go through channel or not. But the partner success and recognition of how important your partners are to your business and enabling onboarding them properly, enabling them as much as you can, and stay on top of them to make sure you know how you can help them to get more leads to get better marketing out there to how to close sales better 
in some cases how you know how to co-sell together it has become so important and these are the things that partners today i believe look for pretty much with any vendor that they're thinking about partnering with they ask those things right what is your onboarding process like what is it that are you willing to invest as a vendor into me partner to help me get out there get a market established and help you um help you drive the revenue so it is um i i i think it's it's great to see that vendors finally got to recognize how important channel partners are and they don't demand anymore only but they invest in that relationship as well very well said and and this is something i'm very passionate about aligning customer success with your partner program and even incentives i've talked about a lot in the past of the the disaggregated incentive model right aligning the incentives to the lifetime value of the customer and maybe we'll leave that for another podcast another day and something that again i'm very passionate about and i can talk about for hours no oh, fantastic i read that article on crn actually so i'll make sure i'll put the uh, link to the article in the description of the episode so people will at least find it and maybe we'll get together again um to talk about this um exact point but christian thank you so so much for coming onto the show and sharing your experience and your knowledge with us about how to maximize driving revenue through the channel it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for coming on thank you so much for having me and that's a wrap for this episode i do hope you found it valuable and if you did please make sure to subscribe and leave a review you can also follow channel voices podcast on linkedin twitter and facebook or just visit channelvoices.com where you can send me a message or leave a voicemail. All of the links are listed in the show notes. And once again, I appreciate you tuning in today. Until next time.